Joseph had kept one of the brothers. So let's pick up the story from chapter 42 and verse 29. Then they went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who is lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine for your household and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. I have to... You cannot help but laugh because he really wants to test them and he really wants to find out if their hearts have changed. And he is going to find out. 35. Then it happened as they emptied their sack that, surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now remember, Reuben is the oldest brother. Reuben is crazy. Crazy Reuben's scheme is this. Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. You can't help but laugh. I mean, he's saying to his father, you've lost your two sons. If you send the third with me and that one's lost, then kill my two sons. So now we would have wiped out a large chunk of the whole family. This is a crazy scheme. And of course, his father refused to listen to him. And in fact, that was the last time Reuben was going to speak on behalf of the others. So let's pick it up in 43, verse 1. Now, the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass, when they had eaten up the grain which they had bought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back and buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, Why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had still another brother? But they said, The man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, Could we possibly have known that he would say, Bring your brother down? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. For from my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruit of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almond. Take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man and may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. So the men took the present and Benjamin and took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. Wow, wow. I hope you saw what happened there. Judah stepped up. Judah had been brooding in the background, something had happened since that time with Tamar. And now listen to Judah. He's willing to give his own life. This is the man that was going to sell Joseph into slavery without any regard. And here he is. He is now ready 
to put his own life on the line. This is a massive change in this man. And because of this moment, even his father had to melt. Because he said, send the lad with me. I will be surety for the lad. I mean, how could even his father resist this? Because this was now a completely different ball game. Judah really had began to change. It is really worth studying the rest of it onto the end of the chapter and into chapter 44, where they'd met up back with their brother Joseph, and he was testing them even one more time to see what would happen. He took all their money and put it back in the mouth of the sack along with one of his cups after he had taken them into the house and fed them. They were very surprised at his actions in the house because he put them in order according to their birth and he put the youngest in the right position, but he gave so much food to his young brother. I mean, he was so happy to see them, but he still wanted to find out where their heart was. We're gonna pick it up in 44 and verse 3. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drank, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? With whomsoever of your servant it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slave. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words, he with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched, he began with the oldest, and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. 14. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell before him on the ground, and Joseph said to them, What deed is this you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are my Lord's slave, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, Go up in peace to your father. It's hard not to see the humor and the tragedy of the situation, but Joseph really had to find out if they had changed. 16. Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. 18. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for... You are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, who is young, his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servant, Bring him down to me, that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. And the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant my father, and the lad is not with us. Since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servant will bring down the gray hair of your servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad 
to my father saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please, let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Least perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. 45.1 Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. This was one of the greatest moments in the early part of the scriptures. Because here you had this man that was now so changed that he was determined to give his life for another. He was absolutely determined. He was pleading to give his life for another. Joseph could not restrain himself. Who could restrain themselves on the those circumstances. I have never read this scripture and not been moved. I, the first time the Holy Spirit revealed this to me, I was so undone that uh, it is hard to put into word and it has never been any different. I am just so undone when I read that and I can feel the passion and the power of what Joseph had to endure at that moment because he finally saw that yes, at least one of the brothers had changed. So we pick it up from chapter three. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. He looked like an Egyptian, and he was so foreign to their thinking and understanding, they couldn't recognize him. But he recognized that something had changed, and he was so happy. He revealed himself to them, he welcomed them, he told them not to worry because the Lord had done this, and it was good. So after that, they were sent back to their father with many gifts and they were invited all of the family to come and to stay in Egypt because there were still five years left at that point of the famine. This is now nine years after Joseph had been released from prison. So we're going to pick it up in verse 49. This is the portion when Jacob is about to die and he's going to bless his sons. And we're going to see something very spectacular here. 49 verse 1. And Joseph called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi, our brothers, instrument of cruelty, are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Curse be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. In essence, the first three sons, Reuben, who is the oldest, and Simeon and Levi did not inherit the blessing because Reuben had slept with one of Jacob's concubines. As for the next two brothers, Simeon and Levi, of course, there was a great inheritance for them because Levi, the tribe of Levi, became the priestly tribe. But back when Jacob had come near to one of the cities, there was an incident where the king's son had raped one of the sisters. Diana. And Jacob made a pact with the king and the men of the land that they could intermarry with his tribe if they were prepared to be circumcised. And of course, as soon as they agreed to be circumcised, these two brothers waited until the third day when they were proper sore, really sore. And they just went into the city and slaughtered the men. This forced Jacob to take flight from that area because he was afraid that all of the tribes was going to unite against him. And in moving, Rachel, his beloved, who was heavily pregnant, was disturbed and she had to give childbirth at the end of that journey. That didn't go down well. She was already elderly and the childbirth killed her. He was not happy with Simeon and Levi for all the trouble they'd caused. So now we come to Judah and we're reading from verse 8. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? 
The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his donkey to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garment in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. I want you to notice that there were some wonderful predictions in there, some prophecies in there. The main one was that the scepter, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. This reference to Shiloh is the first clear reference to the Messiah coming. And this was a very important prophecy because it is saying that the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until the Messiah comes. Now, if you remember in the trial of Yeshua before Pilate, there was a point where Pilate said to the leaders, you take him and try him by your own laws. And they turned to Pilate and said, we have no authority to put a man to death. This was very telling because what they were admitting there was that the scepter for the first time had departed from Judah because even in the Israelite captivity, they still kept the authority to make laws and to try capital crimes. But about the year 6 to 7 AD, the son and successor of Herod, a man named Herod Archelaus, was dethroned and banished to Vienna, a city in Gaul. So his replacement wasn't another king but it was a Roman procreator named Caponius. This meant that the legal power of the Sanhedrin was curtailed. This was standard Roman practice, but they had been spared this up until this point. This led to the rabbis and the leaders running around in Jerusalem in sackcloth, crying that the prophecy had been broken, woe unto us, the prophecy is broken, for the Messiah has not appeared. They, of course, did not recognize that Yeshua was in Nazareth growing up as a young boy at this very same time. Now, let's take a look at Revelation 5, verse 4 and 6. Verse 4, So I wept much, because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Revelation 5, 4 and 6. We see here that Yeshua was proud to be known and to be titled as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Roots of David. And we can also turn over to Revelation 22, verse 16 and 17. Verse 16, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the Root and the Offspring of David, the Bright and the Morning Star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 16 to 17. Brothers and sisters, the scriptures clearly shows us how a man goes from being a serious rogue in every way, a deceiver, a twister, a man that would sell someone into abject slavery, who would think nothing of being involved in trafficking his own family to someone who would stand to give his own life to see an injustice righted. That is a man that is truly born again. And that is the first and worthy journey laid out so clearly in the scriptures. And we just give thanks to this because even though it is not explicitly showing you how a man is born again, it is there and the Holy Spirit has brought it to us. I hope that you have journeyed along, seen this, and has been delighted in this as I have been delighted. So I just bless each and every one of you and I ask the Father now to bless you. Father, 
as we have looked into this word and we have studied this word, I pray that a seed has been sown and that we will love, respect and honor the word because your word is true. You are the word and the word is you. It is forever established in heaven. And we are so grateful because the word is power and we are so filled on the feast of this. And I thank you for this opportunity. Bless each and every on the word. Father, bless each and every one in Yeshua's holy name. Amen.